James Foster Chance was an ex-Marine who grew increasingly isolated from his family and friends during the COVID-19 pandemic. After hearing from James via text on his birthday, his car was discovered abandoned in a Welcome Center parking lot in the Texarkana border about four hours from his home in Texas. He has never been heard from since. Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I couldn't be better, Tim, uh, other than being terribly cold right now. How are you? Uh, I, the same, the same. I, you know, it's the winter. What are you, what are we going to do? It's terrible out there. My God. Yeah, it's so cold. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> you know, at least we've got a, a really interesting case to talk about today. It's the disappearance of James Foster Chance, and the research is brought to us by Private Investigations for the Missing. Check out what they're doing at investigationsforthemissing.org. It is the nonprofit that Bruce Maitland founded, Lance, that you and I are on the board of. Yes, they do fantastic work. It's a great organization. We're proud to be a part of it. And this research was put together by Mary Sarecki, and we're focusing on James Foster Chance. He's been missing since January 19th of 2021. There was a factory reset on his phone on February 28th of 2021. He is an ex-Marine. And Tim, all of this comes together during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we begin to peel back these layers of isolation and anxiety, and it really encapsulated a lot of what everyone was feeling at the time. But unfortunately, James Foster Chance decided that he'd had enough of it. And we don't know where he is, but it is one of those disappearances that's really tough while we're talking about it during the episode to not speculate because you you relate to him. I, I feel like I related to him on some level, just knowing what it was like going through a pandemic. Yeah, I think there are a lot of um, things about the case that sort of actually even reminds me of Maura Murray's case a little bit because he is um, a person who uh, took a trip before he uh, went missing and a trip. It was like three hours away, you know. Um, so, yeah, there are a few mysteries inside the mystery of where James is, I would say. And James is a Caucasian male with red auburn hair and blue eyes. And he's six feet, one inch, 175, and he'd be about 48 years old at the time of this recording. And we do say it in the episode, but I want to say right off the top here, uh, when you look at the missing posters of James Foster Chance, there are some pictures where he's clean shaven and there's some where he has this bushy red beard. So if you're listening to this, keep that in mind. Uh, he really, if he's out there, could be anywhere. And if you have any information, please call the Grapevine Police Department. Detective Shannon Perry is the person in charge at 817-410-8127. Thanks a lot for listening. Follow us on social media at Missing CSM. And we are being joined now by Jennifer Amell. How's it going, Jen? It's going pretty well. Uh, thanks for having me back in the studio here. I'm excited to discuss this case. I think it's um, it's a more recent case than we're used to covering here on Missing. Um, and it definitely takes place during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that may play into the state of mind of this person. And Jennifer, this is a case that came to us via Private Investigations for the Missing? Yes, it was. It was submitted um, to Private Investigations for the Missing and our veteran researcher, Mary Sarecki, completed this excellent research document. Great. Thanks a lot, Mary. Well, James Foster Chance has been missing since February 28th, 2021. The last date of contact was on January 19th, 2021. Those were uh, birthday text messages. 
He's missing from Grapevine, Texas, white male, date of birth, January 19th, 1973, 48 years old, six foot, one inch, 175 pounds. He's got red, auburn hair, blue eyes, known to wear aviator style sunglasses. Left index finger is scarred and a little crooked at the second knuckle. He's got a small scar as a result of attempting a navel piercing as well. Known to wear jeans, button-down tapered shirts with long-sleeved colored undershirts. And James's car was found abandoned. He was driving a 2005 Toyota MR2, a coupe, black, Texas plates, license plate CYY1882, and the registration expired in 2021. One detail to note that we can dive in deeper on is that he's been missing since February 28, 2021, and that was known because of a factory reset on his phone. So as a kid, James, um, he was the youngest of three children. He has a brother called Larry and a sister called Chris. Um, and sometimes James is referred to by his middle name, Foster. And according to James's mom, Connie, he was a pretty happy child. He had an aunt, Terry, who was very fond of James and said he was a typical youngest child. He was happy, fun, and uh, very inquisitive. He was a little different. He liked to sew, and he was into gaming, and he didn't care so much for sports. His family traveled throughout his childhood because of his father's job. He went to high school in Colorado, and after high school, he actually joined the Marines and was pulled out of basic training to join the silent drill team for two years. Um, He was then the the leader of this drill team during the third and fourth years of his service. And it's pretty rare to serve this many years in the silent drill team. The Marine Corps Silent Drill Platoon is a 24-man rifle platoon that performs a unique precision drill exhibition. This is highly disciplined, and the platoon exemplifies the professionalism associated with the Marine Corps. This probably has nothing to do with anything, but I just wanted to note how interesting it is to me that he liked to sew, um, which his mother probably taught him. And then he joins this platoon that's highly disciplined. I don't know if there's a connection there, but someone who likes to sew, I would imagine, uh, is is almost a perfectionist. It's a very intricate uh, process to to sew something uh in any in any form of quality and it doesn't really surprise me that someone with that mentality would go into um a very like you said highly disciplined uh division of the marines yeah that's a interesting parallel to draw because there's so much attention to detail that's needed in both of these things yeah absolutely i think maybe being in the marines might be why uh his posture was so uh was so uh, reportedly so good even even mentioned on missing flyers After the Marines, he moved to Phoenix where his parents lived, and this is where he got interested in a career in the telecom business. And he married Jennifer, and they bought a house together. And Connie said that Jennifer was a good match for Foster because they were both sharp and fast on their feet, and that Foster didn't have much patience for people who weren't quick in that way. Well, that is interesting, too, because, right, we just kind of said that sewing and uh, sort of his uh, platoon in the Marines, you know, that kind of thing takes a lot of patience. So it's almost interesting, I think, that uh, and maybe almost contradictory that he doesn't uh, appreciate other patient people. Well, I think it has more to do with um, precision and not having patience with people who don't seem to know where they're going Um, physically, Mm. um, emotionally. uh, You know, like, I don't know if you're a fast walker, but if you're a fast walker, you can't walk with people who don't walk fast. You you have Mm. a destination that you're going to and you get there and you perform the duty that you're going to, like if you're going to get get a coffee, why are you dallying about, you know, not going to get your coffee? So I I think it all just speaks to his uh, sense of precision. And his mom says that the brothers tried to start a business doing hauling. But, uh, but it didn't actually work out. And according to court documents in Phoenix, it was James, along with his then-wife Jennifer, Connie, and Ken, who owned Last Chance Construction, LLC. And James's brother Larry appeared to own Last Chance Construction, which was not an LLC, by himself. And this info is according to uh, civil court info from 2005. 
Now, I wonder if that caused some sort of conflict between Larry and James, where James seemed to want to include the family and Larry seemed to want to do the business on his own. I, I don't know if it was exactly a coincidence that both of them chose the same name, but one's an LLC, the other one appears to be a sole proprietorship. Uh, so I don't know if there was some competition there, but it's interesting nonetheless. After being married for about three years, James and Jennifer unfortunately got a divorce and they sold their home. And this is when James uh, really started to withdraw from his family. He was working with Altel and was transferred to Little Rock, Arkansas in 2005. And he did this without saying a word to his family. He picked up and left without telling anyone. Uh, the family did eventually track him down, but he never gave a reason for not telling his family where he was going. Any thoughts on why he wouldn't tell his family? Well, I would say the obvious is something to do with the business. Um, the business didn't work out. Uh, the family, you know, tried to work on this together and and something went wrong. You know, it uh, it ended up going under and it probably led to uncomfortability with uh, his family members. Um, I do find it interesting in the context of this conversation because we're talking about um, how he goes missing later. And um, here is a point where he left for a period of time without telling anybody. Yeah. And then his marriage as well. So you have all of these components that are folding on top of each other that represent failure. And again, going back to the sewing, the, the Marines, the precision, uh, he might not have had a lot of failure prior to that. Maybe just not able to deal with personal failure, professional failure at the same time or, or close to the same time. Maybe there's a little PTSD in there as well from being in the Marines. So taking off and, and just clearing the head might have been what he was looking for at that time. And while he lived in Little Rock, he made friends with people at work, including a close friend named Doug. And James bought a house there and was going out with friends on occasion. Doug had gotten close with James, and he spoke of James's unique personality, his upright posture, as we mentioned, and his aversion to authority figures and the intensity of his nature. Both James and Doug had the same dry sense of humor and matched wits. Doug also said that James was his mentor and extremely intelligent. And they were so close that James was in Doug's wedding, but once Doug and his wife started having kids and James moved to the Dallas area, they lost contact. And Doug was under the impression that James was estranged from his family, especially his dad. I'm not trying to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but the way this seems to be playing out is that we're going back to maybe a strained relationship with James's father a good close relationship with his mother again the military uh, what what struck me was his aversion to authority figures the father is an authority figure people in the military they're all you know your commanding officers are an authority figure he was even the leader of that that platoon as well so he was an authority figure as well um i just feel like there's a lot building up there a lot of conflicting emotions that are starting to uh, play out and if the path that I'm going down is is accurate or close to accurate, we know that he revealed all that to his friend Doug. Perhaps he didn't reveal that to his wife or he withheld some emotion from his wife for a time, which might have caused that marriage to be strained. Yeah, it doesn't sound like anything too specific that he um, mentioned to Doug about his family or his dad. You know, he just because it says Doug was under the impression. So. Uh, my my guess is there was nothing like no direct conversation about why or anything like that in the years that they knew each other. And according to the Missing James Foster Chance Facebook page, a woman named Jasmine said that they remained close after dating for about a year in Little Rock. And even after James moved to Grapevine, they stayed close. She said that after he returned home from visiting her in October of 2016, his texts became less of his typical playful banter and turned more serious, including more personal information, which he never spoke of in the past. And she said that he seemed depressed. And they texted less and less in 2017 through 2019. And she didn't recall even being in touch with James in 2020. Man, this is just the perfect recipe for feeling the isolation of uh, the pandemic and, and having to stay inside, not even going out and like grocery shopping. Uh, again, you're talking about somebody who loved moving fast and, and being being out and about, I'm, I'm guessing. And this, again, just the perfect recipe for depression. Yeah, we already see this pattern before the pandemic hit of him pulling away from first his family and now a prior relationship and he has to move again from 
Little Rock to Dallas. So by 2009, James had transferred to the Dallas office in the network repairs unit. And Altel, I guess, was bought out by Verizon. So he was now a Verizon employee. His Aunt Terry actually didn't live very far from him at this point, And he spent many weekends visiting and going out with his Aunt Terry and her family. He would go with them to concerts and other shows and visit on holidays. According to Terry, James often joked about being antisocial and having no friends in the town that he ended up moving to in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, a town called Grapevine. And he joked that the reason why he had a pickup truck is because he had no friends to help him should he need to move something. He told her that she was the only person he really liked. And after moving into his apartment in Grapevine, James still owned his house in Louisiana. And he never did sell it and was paying both mortgage and rent payments every month. And when Connie retired around 2012, 2013, she realized she had free time and decided to go to Louisiana to sell James's house for him. And nobody ever found out exactly why James had not sold the house himself. And it was around this time when Connie and Ken say that they obtained a broad power of attorney so that they would be able to sell James's house. Well, that's interesting. I, I don't even know what to think of that. I, if he's uh, talking about having no friends in Grapevine, but he's own, he still owns a home in Louisiana, why is he paying double you know, rent and mortgage? That had to have been really tough financially. And I am not sure how a power of attorney is uh, assigned. Does, can anyone clarify that for, for me? I think sometimes power of attorney comes into play if someone is not able to manage their own affairs, either due to an illness or some kind of psychiatric disorder. But in this case, it doesn't seem like James was in that kind of situation. It was just that he didn't have time or wasn't willing to perhaps emotionally part with this home. So this is why his parents stepped in. And I suppose that they would have to get James's permission explicitly to become powers of attorney. Yeah, that is a really interesting uh, situation to be in. I mean, something had to have happened for Connie and Ken to identify that James wasn't, in their opinion, capable of maintaining both or or maintaining uh, the mortgage or, or something. Or maybe just the upkeep of the house was it maybe it was falling apart. I don't know. It's just interesting. Maybe it was just one of those things that like just needed to be done, but. James was dragging his feet for whatever reason and his mom retired and she's like, you know, I I have time to go do this, you know, clean up the house, maybe do some repairs, put it on the market. You know, it's a big job to sell a house. So maybe it was just like, let me like his mom was was like, um, let me just do this for you. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if there's uh, some depression here too and maybe that's uh partially why i think um you know he separated from his family without telling them in 2005 it's like i don't know eight years before this or something and then this is still like nine or ten years before he goes missing or you know so i think during this period he seems quite depressed in my opinion yeah and and i feel like again it's just unfolding in a way where if He's out there, wherever he is, people need to identify his mental state. The, this has been a gradual break for a while. And we'll, we'll get into that a little later. Yeah, so this brings us up to 2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, his Aunt Terry said that James had become way more, quote, freaked out about it than most 48-year-old men. Um, He was very worried and always had advice for his aunt and her family on how to stay safe. Um, It didn't appear that James was going anywhere during the pandemic in 2020, and he was more isolated than ever before. Um, Definitely no judgment on James's part. We all responded in different ways um, to something like this. I know I definitely went through a period of time where I was like, couldn't get myself to even go in the elevator down from the apartment that I was staying in. Like, you just didn't know what to do. So I don't think this is that odd, in my opinion, but um, definitely lends to James's state of mind if, if he wasn't able to, like, move beyond that fear. 100% agree uh, how everyone dealt with it differently. And I can't imagine somebody who is used to having things under control experiencing something that was so out of control and, and not knowing that something not knowing what could happen, something completely 
terrible, like worse than what actually happened. You know, a lot of people were having those paranoid thoughts or those, you know, anxiety induced thoughts of like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen next month? And and then and the next month I could see someone with his, I don't know, perceived sense of control being very threatened by that. Yeah. And he was already sort of isolated and, uh, and this only sent him further down that path. Yeah. It seems the only people in James's life at this point was his aunt and her family. And I guess once the, the lockdown procedures began, he didn't even see them. So he was completely isolated. And by James's 48th birthday on January 19th, 2021, he owned a Dodge pickup and a Toyota Spider. And he had been living in the same apartment for over 10 years. He had responded to texts from people on his 48th birthday. And from what it had seemed, he had been staying at home since the pandemic began in March of 2020, and he wasn't talking to or seeing any friends, which, uh, as we noted, w- wasn't really that unusual considering the situation. But again, he's already isolated, and now he's withdrawing even further. All right, and he's coming up on a year. That's a, that's a long time being in a single apartment. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, I think that's why we have the date of January 19th, which is also his birthday as the last known communication anyone has had with James. And on February 7th, 2021, a towing company did a routine parking sweep in the parking lot of James's apartment complex. And according to that tow company, their records indicate that both of James's vehicles were in the apartment parking lot. An important uh, moment to note is that on February 11th of 2021, do you remember when that car pile up, it was like 133 cars on the Dallas area freeway during that freak winter storm? Do you remember that pile up and it blocked, uh, I don't even know how many miles of highway? It's interesting to note because you have that pile up and you have this freak storm and around the February 12th to February 17th time frame of 2021, a neighbor of James reported that they saw him cleaning up water damage at his apartment. So there was some impact that that storm might have had on him if that water damage was from that storm. Yeah, I don't know if there is potentially some connection between that pileup and James's uh, window of opportunity to leave his apartment um, if he had to take that interstate, I mean, that becomes important because he wouldn't have been able to travel in that direction. Um, But we just don't know at what point James left his home. Right. And I think it can speak to just the general dangers out there, right? So there's already the pandemic happening. And then um, there's some sort of freak weather and people in Texas, um, you know, at least on that freeway, you know, weren't were dealing with that weather so well, but still, there was something very important for James that made him leave his house. And I guess that's what we don't know. It seems like it would be more difficult to leave during all these obstacles. It's a great point. Um, Not knowing the connection, but knowing that that moment did happen and it was so freak. And now you're talking about somebody who's got increasing anxiety, more paranoia than probably the average person. And then this freak storm happens and then this pileup happens. He's going on a year of being isolated. I mean, this is the end of the world for him. This could have been in his head the the end of the world. The apocalypse is coming and, and he needed to get out. So the water damage was actually a story on the CBS News, but no one found the neighbor who uh, supposedly reported this, so it really can't be confirmed. And then later, his his father, Ken, says that there were a couple of box fans with cardboard on them running, and the cupboard doors under his sink in the, in the apartment were open. Uh, there was no sign of water damage, and the landlord confirmed that the power never went out. So those are the facts, according to Ken, according to James's father and the landlord. So I don't know if this, again, speaks to increasing paranoia. But- yeah, so the options are there was water damage and he took care of it and it, it wasn't seen, um, that damage, uh, a couple months later. Or there was no water damage and he was uh, working on something that appeared to be uh, water damage. And so sometime between February 17th and February 19th, 2021, James drove the Toyota Spider to a Motel 6 about 30 miles away in Denton, Texas. And according to phone records, James had called a few Motel 6s in the area before taking the trip. And this is also a time where 
There was the aforementioned winter storm and record low temperatures in the Dallas area. But uh, bank records show that he stayed three nights in this Denton Motel 6 and had spent money from his bank account on gas and at a nearby liquor store. And by the time that Cannon Connie had been called in April, it was far too late to get any video surveillance from the liquor store or gas station. And it is certain that whoever checked into that motel had James's ID and debit card. The time that he checked into this Motel 6 was February 17th, 18th, and 19th. But by February 28th of 2021, there was a factory reset on James's phone. Uh, We don't know if he had another phone or why he might have reset his phone or if it had just fell into another person's hands and they did a factory reset. The same day, his Toyota was caught on a highway cam on Highway 30 in Rockwall, Texas. So to quickly recap, we know that someone with James's ID and debit card had been at the Motel 6 on February 19th. So three days, the 17th, 18th, and 19th, and then um, over a week later, on the 28th, was the next known activity that's connected to James, which is a factory reset on his phone, and his car was caught on a highway cam which is uh, pretty interesting to me that they managed to catch that, that car on, on a highway cam. I guess it was probably at a toll, I'm, I'm imagining. But um, the factory reset on the phone is interesting. Uh, the, I don't know how you could do that on someone else's phone without knowing a passcode or, or how to you know hack into it. Well, there's definitely ways to do a factory reset if you don't have the passcode. Um, it would require some knowledge of how cell phones work. I don't know if he had an iPhone. I think it's a little bit harder to do that. But if he did have an Android, I think um, there's actually a little button in the back of an Android phone that you can press to reset. Oh, geez. I didn't know that, hacker. (laughs) (laughs) But I would say there's there's really no reason to, to think that there was someone else with him you know, who, who had his phone or debit card or ID or reset the phone. You know, I, I don't think anyone else did that but him. I'm curious where he was for the nine days after he left the uh, motel on the 19th. And then the next activity is the 28th. Right. What was going through his head? He went from spending, yeah. um, you know, a year alone in an apartment to uh, spending three nights alone in a Motel 6, not far from where he lived. A week after that, he resets his phone completely. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to guess voluntarily. Yeah. Yeah. And almost a month later on March 22nd, uh, his Toyota Spider is towed after being left at a welcome center on the Arkansas side of Texarkana. It must have been there about three weeks because this is the typical time that vehicles are left before being towed. Um, James was not reported missing yet, so it was towed to a yard and a letter was sent to James's address. But law enforcement supposedly searched the vehicle and found one small notebook. James had a lot of these uh, notebooks at his apartment and that he would use to jot down ideas or grocery lists or things of that nature. And the officer said that that was all he found in the vehicle. There were no keys, nothing in the vehicle at all. So that three weeks sort of backs us up right to the point basically where he reset the phone or, or somebody reset his phone. And this welcome center is about four hours away from his apartment in Grapevine. So what was he doing traveling that far? This is quite far from the motel he was staying at, too. And so his travels from where he lived in Grapevine, he had driven east, uh, sort of through Dallas, and then he was spotted in Rockwall, which was is really just east of Dallas, a little northeast. And then so he was on that Highway 30, and that's where his car was found in Texarkana. Um, which is about two hours and 20 minutes um, east of Rockwall, which is also pretty close to the Louisiana border. Maybe 45 minutes south is the Louisiana border, which is where he used to live. So maybe some familiar territory for him. And it does appear that that town, Texarkana, is split by Arkansas and Texas. And it appears that he was on the Arkansas side. But yes, you're right just south is Louisiana. So somewhere along the lines, instead of going off of Highway 30 and taking one of the many highways 
that would lead him into Louisiana, whoever was driving that car made the decision to continue on and, and go into Arkansas. Yeah, and that would be a little bit northeast and missing um, a more direct southern route into the state of Louisiana. So, yeah, I don't know why he would be heading in this direction if it was indeed James. On April 12th, 2021, a wellness check was done by James's landlord because rent was late, and that was unlike James. And uh, James's dad got a call from the landlord to say that they couldn't contact James and that the rent was late. And Ken was phoned because he was one of the contacts on James's lease, um, which is kind of strikes me as odd that, uh, you know, his friend Doug said that he had issues with his father, but, you know, he's one of the only people on this lease. But also the landlord said that James wasn't in the habit of paying his rent that far in advance. James had paid his rent in advance for February and March. He paid that in late January. And so here, about midway through April, he hadn't paid April's uh, because he was nowhere to be found. Yeah, this is an interesting thing to note because um, it kind of points to the fact that maybe James had intentions to leave for a couple months and he wanted to make sure that rent was you know, paid out for those two months. But it also speaks to the fact that he intended to come back too because he kept his apartment. He didn't tell the landlord that he wanted to get out of his lease or anything. So it seems like he had intentions to come back in March. Uh, Yeah, I I would I would agree with that, because if he was suffering from like a significant sudden mental break, I don't think he would have been thinking about rent or coming back. Uh, This was something that he was doing out of courtesy and out of um, the the you know, he signed a lease like it was a contract that he was uh, upholding. He didn't want to make it seem like he was bailing on the apartment. And yeah, he looks like he wanted to come back, take off for a couple of months while things maybe <laughs> maybe chilled out in Texas. Well, I mean, that's kind of what he did with his house, right? He he had left his house. The only difference being he, he did pay those, uh, you know, the mortgage for that. Yeah, there's a parallel there. Yeah, and I think it like can't be stressed enough that um, this was like right around the time that he left was the time of this winter snowstorm that like the whole nation was kind of glued to their television sets watching this like storm happen in Texas of all places. So I think to, to James, he's leaving right in the middle of this. Like, was he trying to get away from his living situation thinking that like, as you said, Lance, that this was the end of the world, like that could have really compelled him to go elsewhere. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And the next day on April 13th, 2021, law enforcement was called to James's apartment, and that's when they filed the missing persons report dated April 15th, 2021. The officer did check the apartment and said everything was in order. My only question on this is what defines in order? Is it neat and there's no sign of struggle? There's no sign of a panicked, you know, process of leaving, like drawers were all in, in, in place, clothes are folded and all that. Is that what that means? I mean, keep in mind, we do have that um, report from Ken, his father, that uh, there was box fans all over the place and his uh, cupboard doors were open too, alluding to some water damage. So if the police are not counting that as like odd or in order, then I suppose that's true. But um, yeah, I mean, there's there's another report saying that like all his stuff was there, but his television was on his bed, laying on his bed. And I don't know if that's normal. Right. And um Aunt Terry and her partner uh, went into James's apartment around April 23rd, and uh, they did they did find some odd things um, as well. And they said that uh, they found James's bag that he would normally take with them when he visits: a shaving kit, shoes, boots, and uh, and that was all still in the apartment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and going back to this television on the bed, um, it's been speculated by his father Ken that. James may have been sleeping on the couch since he did have uh, sleeping problems. Um, she said that she found everything that she would expect there, except um, his Kindle and his laptop were gone. Uh, there was an old laptop there, but it wasn't the current one that James had been using. She also found some uncashed checks in his apartment as well. He had all of his payments set up on an automatic payment except for rent. Uh, Ken said that for all of the projects and things that James had going on, 
it didn't really seem as though he was handling his day-to-day affairs. TV on the bed's odd. I wonder, did he have a TV? Do we know if he had one in the living room or, or near the couch? Because maybe he moved the TV from where it was in the bedroom and put it on the bed because he could see it from the couch if he was like trying to fall asleep on the couch. It's a really interesting factor in how his apartment was left. Yeah, it could be moving some stuff around. But yeah, I agree. I would like to know more about the layout um, and sort of why the TV was uh, taking a rest on the bed there. And I do wonder if uh, that old laptop was checked um, or if it was wiped or factory reset like uh, like we assume James did to his phone. It's a good point. I mean, if he's got the wherewithal and he's got some reason for factory resetting his phone and he takes his Kindle and he takes his current laptop, it wouldn't surprise me if he did that intentionally on the old laptop. Well, get this, guys. So in April or May, we're not really sure, Ken and Connie got James's vehicle, that Toyota Spider, out of the tow yard um, and it had taken it to a dealership to be rekeyed. Connie was looking over the inside of the car and she actually found James's phone in the glove box. So remember we mentioned that a patrol officer had searched this car and found only that small notebook. I'm just wondering how they may have missed his phone in the glove box. I would guess just human error. You know, I think that's something that happens during searches. But I mean, if you're looking in a car, I get human error, but if you're looking in a car, I mean, the most basic place you look probably first is the glove box. I mean, glove box under the seat. I mean, other than just looking at the seats themselves, it's the the, the most natural spot to search. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was underneath like the registration or something. Maybe it was, you know, put underneath something and it just wasn't considered to, uh, you know, look any deeper in there. Yeah, that's true, Lance. Um, I think it's also important to note that when the police officer searched this car, they didn't know it belonged to a missing person either because there was no report filed at the time. But I just think like if you find an abandoned vehicle, you may do kind of an in-depth search of that vehicle just in case, you know, it becomes relevant to a case down the line. And once James was missing, Terry had found a box in his apartment that was shipped to James in 2017 that was apparently full of his office items along with an inventory of those items. So it kind of sounds like he was uh, fired or laid off um, by Verizon, and uh, but nobody knew it. And apparently he didn't tell anybody. And he had actually been telling his Aunt Terry that he was still working during the pandemic and he was able to work from home. Yeah. And according to some bank records that James's parents were able to obtain with that broad power of attorney that they had um, going back to the sale of the house, his paychecks actually stopped being deposited into his bank in 2017 as well. And after that, there was no other income posted to his bank account. They assumed that he had been living on the modest proceeds from the sale of his house. James's parents also said that there were a few substantial deposits that they assumed may have been from Verizon, but they're not sure. And it is not known if James had any other bank accounts or perhaps he was working under the table for cash. It appeared as though James stayed home alone and had no contact with the outside world once the pandemic began. He wasn't even working at this point. Man, this is just a continuing recipe for paranoia and depression and wanting to uh, run. I mean, it's uh, it's 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 tragic. It's really sad. I mean, it's not uncommon as well. Right. That's another sort of puzzle piece to this um, that we didn't know earlier, you know, that uh, he was having severe financial problems and um, absolutely could have uh, contributed to his isolation and being withdrawn and uh, I guess taking a trip. Yeah, I think it's a situation that a lot of us found ourselves in during like the height of the pandemic. Like if you weren't able to work from home or you got laid off, there's definitely some like situations where you could claim un- unemployment or, you know, uh, some COVID-19 relief funds and stuff. But I think because James had suffered so many f- what he considered failures in his, in his life, like the failure of that business, the failure of his marriage. Um, this was just one more thing that he wasn't able to accept psychologically. And that's why he didn't tell anybody in his family that this had happened. And perhaps what prevented him from like 
trying to find another job or trying to make ends meet or apply for those, you know, funds that existed at the time. Um, maybe it just like became way too overwhelming for him. And he's like, I just got to leave. Yeah, that's a good point. But if he was laid off or fired uh, in 2017, he wouldn't have been eligible to claim any COVID relief funds um, if he wasn't uh, fired or laid off due to the pandemic, I guess, in 2019 or 2020 or, you know, early 2021. That's really fair. Yeah, I, I didn't consider that. I think it would make it a lot harder to apply for any kind of unemployment claim if it had been, you know, three years since he was laid off. But what was he doing for those years? I mean, uh, they his parents said that there were some substantial deposits, which, um, you know, they did they didn't know what that's from. That's they speculated maybe that was from Verizon, like severance pay or something like that. But I don't think that's something you get like years later or something like that. I think that's something you kind of get when you're laid off. And then, you know, so I, I don't know what those substantial deposits would be. Not really any more info on that. Yeah, I don't know why you wouldn't be able to tell where that money came from if it was from Verizon, because there would be some way to track that. Like on the deposit note, it would be like from the Verizon company. So if there was like no uh, company or name attached to this deposit, I doubt it was actually from Verizon. It's a good point. He definitely had some sort of income, probably, you know, in in uh, conjunction with the uh, the sale from the house in Louisiana. I mean, enough where he was paying rent and paying for two vehicles and then enough where he could travel. And he, he was confident enough that he would have enough funds to travel for a couple of months on top of paying rent and getting a motel room. So I don't know what other maybe he was doing contract work or something. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Sometimes that can be cash. Um you know, he probably wasn't doing anything illegal um, because he's depositing that into his bank. You know, it's not like he's probably uh, selling drugs to earn that money. And sometime in May of 2021, law enforcement actually did an official search with dogs at the Texarkana Welcome Center. And uh, unfortunately, they found nothing. Yeah, I wonder like how many I wonder how many cents are going on there. At a, at a welcome center. Um, it, you know, we're not talking about two giant cities, uh, the, the crossroads of two giant cities or anything, but you are talking about the crossroads of, of two states, you know, when you have Arkansas and Texas. I'm sure there's tons of people there. I mean, if we're supposing James drove his car there himself, right, it is an interesting spot to leave your car. Um, especially if you have sort of a disdain for authority figures, as it was noted earlier. Being on the border of two state lines could complicate the investigation, you know, to find him. Yeah, it's interesting to me that his car was found in this welcome center, like right on the state line. Um, we know from past cases, um, especially Israel Keys, who would often um, try to confuse the investigation by doing things like across state lines or right on the border between states. Um, so you don't know whose jurisdiction it is. So just the fact that James's car is found here um, seems suspicious to me. And I mean, this is a wild speculation, but yeah, it definitely seems purposeful in some way. Yeah, well, I would say it could speak to James's state of mind. Um, I'm not looking at this case right now like um, there was someone else there who abducted him and tried to um, confuse the investigation. It seems more to me like James might have done it himself and got there to that point. And I think knowing that the police did an official search right there speaks to what they thought in their investigation of his state of mind at that time. Like, uh, I, I would bet that they brought out cadaver dogs, maybe search dogs too, but it seems to me that they might have been looking for his um, body uh, in the woods surrounding the, that um, welcome center. Yeah. I mean, there's also the potential that they wanted to catch his scent somewhere. I don't know if that's possible that after James had been there, um, but maybe they wanted a direction of travel too. Yeah. And and you're, you're right the, about the car being there like that feels like a deliberate choice, deliberately putting the car at a spot that would have as many people seeing it as possible. I mean, if if someone is driving into the woods or to one of those lakes to commit suicide, they're, they're driving that distance and their opportunity to commit suicide is to drown themselves in a lake or go into the woods and, and maybe shoot themselves. 
why are you leaving your car at a place where hundreds of people a day are going to see that car? You know, doesn't that feel like contradictory? I think it's interesting that uh, whoever put the car there took the keys too. Yeah. And the laptop and Kindle. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, this is also, uh, you know, a welcome center where there are a bunch of cars. Um, so not a bad spot to leave one car and get into another if you either have one waiting there for you or even if you're hitchhiking. That's a good point. Actually, just talking about that kind of reminds me of the end of a very sort of random movie called Five Easy Pieces, uh, which was starring Jack Nicholson. And uh, it's really, I love the movie. Um, and, uh, he, he parks at a rest stop at the end and gets into a truck and leaves. And that's the end of the movie. It was a guy who sort of had some personal difficulties with his family and friends and just leaves his life at and the end, the end of the movie. Sorry, to, sorry for the spoiler, but I think it came out in the seventies. <laughs> I mean, that is an incredible point. And that's, uh, not something that is uncommon. Somebody being influenced by a movie or, or, you know, a show or a book or something, a really interesting, really interesting point. Yeah, and uh, per James's mom, Connie, James didn't have any known mental illness and no substance abuse issues. And according to Ken, his phone records only showed contact with the landlord, a pizza place, and a tire shop in the month or so before James went missing. Doug, his friend, said, said that he didn't see James as the type to commit suicide. And even if he did, he absolutely would leave a note. He said that James is not an impulsive person. For that, I would say I, I kind of, no offense to Doug, but I kind of throw that out. I mean, we, we've heard stories, uh, we've covered a lot of cases, and, um, you know, that, that's pretty much always said by the family or friends um, that they're not the type. And um, he does mention that if, if it, he was the type, he would have left a note. Well, you know, we don't know where James is, so he he may have. Yeah, that's true. And I hate to say this, but James is kind of the person who would do stuff without telling anybody. I mean, he left and moved without telling anybody. He lost his job and he didn't tell anybody. I don't see how a decision to perhaps end his life, um, why he would do any differently. You know, but what we do know is that he paid his rent through March, uh, like two months early. So he had a plan and going to what Doug was saying, that's not an impulsive thing to do. This was actually premeditated that he wanted it his that we know he wanted his rent to be paid for some reason two months in advance um and ken his father said that he was down to just a couple thousand dollars so maybe the time had come maybe it was that you know andy dufresne moment to reference another movie the time had come for him to make his escape he was down to a couple thousand anything less he wouldn't have had enough to go as far as he wanted to go yeah and as noted by his father james really wasn't the person to ask for help if he needed it either. He'd much rather try to manage things on his own. And before we wrap here, I want to make an important note that on the missing poster, he's shown clean shaven with short hair. He's also shown with more of a bushy style haircut, clean cut on the sides, but a big beard, a big red beard and much longer hair, but cut in a way where he's letting the top part of it grow out. And it really doesn't look like the same person. So that's something important to note. Think about those weeks that went by from, you know, the beginning of February or even his birthday when, you know, people weren't seeing him. They were texting him. He could have been growing that beard out for weeks. So by the time he landed in that welcome center, he, he might not have looked like the same person at all. That's a great point. And this is a guy who was um, former military and, uh, you know, military culture is sort of, uh, you know, very clean shaven. Um, hair and face. Um, so yeah, there's probably a lot of pictures of him like that and not too many of him with the big bushy beard and longer hair. Yeah, definitely true. Um, the, the family has a Facebook page dedicated to finding uh, James. It's called Missing Dash James Foster Chance. Um, it's sort of a, a catch-all for people to post information, to post memories, you know, and well wishes for the family. Um, additionally, we have a number for the detective assigned to this case. This is Detective Shannon Perry of the Grapevine Police Department. And if you have any information on the disappearance of James Foster Chance, you can contact them at 817-410-8127. 